So, but so then, when you say warm, you're talking about just anything in the positive Celsius. Yeah, anything in the positive. It's yeah, it's it's, it's a good ten degrees above what it was last, last week. We were down to minus five, minus six at times, uh, certainly first thing in the morning. Uh, and yesterday it was five. I think it got up to about seven, maybe eight Celsius. So it's a good ten plus. So yeah, it's warm. <laughs> Back in shorts, I think. Yeah, well, I was just going to say you, you are in the short sleeves. It's um, it's below twenty degrees here, and I, I'm not going to take off the long sleeves or, or the jeans or anything like that. Well, I went out for a walk yesterday, and uh, I think I could have been back in the shorts so last you. night. Yeah, yeah, um, insane is uh, as I'm going to finish that. Absolutely bloody insane, but. Um, I believe we are live now on the on the on the Facebook and YouTube. So it's time we we kick this uh, pull this train out of the station, kick the football off, and say good day and welcome to everyone uh, who is either in the Zoom chat with us tonight or watching on social media for a Discover Boutique Whiskey uh, Company virtual tasting. My name is Scott Fitzsimons from the Oak Barrel in Sydney, Australia, in warm and sunny. Although it did rain a little bit, Sydney, Australia, uh, and joining me. Um, from, from the UK is Dave Worthington in what looks like grey and cold. But if you heard the end of that conversation, at least it is positive degrees Celsius and they're not covered in snow. Dave, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, very well. Thank you very much for having me in. Looking forward to this uh, early morning whiskey tasting. I'm still just sipping the coffee, but I have got the whiskies and the glasses out. So I will be joining in with you because um, it's not a whiskey tasting if I'm not joining in with you, is it? Yeah, there is um, in, in the email correspondence that, that went back and forth for, for those who uh, obviously weren't privy to that. There is uh, it's, it's a bit of a known fact that Dave is not a, a, um, opposed to a breakfast dram uh, here and again. But um, I want to um, give, give a bit of context for, for tonight's tasting for those who have either joined us before or who are, who are coming with us. Um, when uh, lockdown first hit uh, Sydney about 11, well, about 11 months ago now, we, uh, we panicked uh, pretty quickly. There was a couple of days here at the Oak Barrel. We didn't really know what we were going to be doing. And so, but then quickly jumped on the phone and uh, called a few suppliers, and including that particular whiskey company, and thought, thought what, who has miniatures or small format whiskies uh, in the country that we could sort of use to do virtual tastings? And we were lucky enough that there were uh, a bunch of different boutique whiskies sitting around from not only all different distilleries in Scotland, but all over the world, um, and then some other packs as well that we could use some prepackaged things. So, uh, it feels like a little bit of a blast from the past, um, and it does feel like a long time ago uh, that we did our very first virtual tasting. And, and Dave, you joined us from from there, uh, from that exact room, almost eleven months ago, I believe. Yeah, I've, I've hardly moved from this room in, in the last eleven months. The last time I went out officially on business with Boutique Whiskey was I came home on the thirteenth of March last year. And so, yeah, this has been my home, shackled to this desk and, and have travelled all around the world um, without moving. No passport required and everything done from here. So early morning tastings on your side of the pond and uh, late night tastings or very, very early in the morning tastings um, from the other side of the pond. So, uh, yeah, this is this is life at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and um... stuck in the box. We, uh, we, we, we were just chatting before we went live, and obviously um, we, we really hope that Melbourne uh, knocks this one out of the park, as, as they have done in the past, and can come out of lockdown tomorrow night. But um, same, same thing goes for, to you guys over there in the UK um, who've been, you know, it's not been a, an easy period, and, and hopefully everyone's staying reasonably sane and, and, more importantly, reasonably safe over there at the moment. Um, but... Tonight's tasting was, was very much about visiting some of our favourite whiskies from the past year. And I did get a hit up a little bit over the, uh, the Christmas and January period saying, we saw these tastings, but we didn't really know how to get involved in that sort of thing. So I've got a lot of new faces uh, coming in and joining us tonight, which is, which is really cool. Um, but we've picked four, four whiskies. Um, if, if you did manage to grab one of the sample packs, you might even have these whiskies at home. And if, if you don't, you can drink along with whatever you want. That's fine. Um, but we've got four whiskies we're going to go through tonight, um, chosen for different reasons. But just before we sort of get, get started, and I, I'll let Dave talk a little bit about Boutique. Um, if we were doing this in the, the tasting room, which is just opposite me here, we'd be pouring you 15 mil samples. Now, if you've bought this pack, you've got 50 mil uh, samples. So that's 5.0 rather than 1.5. Uh, so please do not feel like you need to drink all the whiskey tonight because we're 
we're all about we're about 50 percent on all of them almost exactly um and there's quite a substantial number of drinks in each of these so uh please th this is designed so you can actually go back to some of these whiskies later on whether it's tonight or tomorrow or next week or whatever um but also please do get an uber from your living room to your bedroom tonight when you finish up dramming <laughs> particularly if you go over that that 15 mil um sample so um it's going to be an exciting year for boutique um, here at the Oak Barrel and in Australia in general. I know that there's some exciting things on the horizon. There wasn't a huge amount of new releases that came into Australia last year across anything. Um, and obviously, since the last time we've, we've spoken the last week, the Scotch whiskey, um, you know, export figures for, for last year have come out and they don't make particularly good reading. But there wasn't a lot of uh, whiskey exported. But um, there's going to be a lot of new things from various places this year, which is going to be very, very exciting. So um, it, it's a brand that, you know, I kind of wanted to, to keep in, in the forefront and introduce a few people to. And, um, you know, Dave, before you talk about the, the brand in its essence, maybe you just want to say how what 2020 looked like for, for the brand. I mean, you're obviously sitting in, in your room doing tastings. You can't travel. You're maybe not doing bottling, but the whiskey's still sitting there. The whiskey's still maturing and getting older. So, I mean, how, how does the company approach 2021? Um, well, yeah, we've, um, we've collected quite a bit of whiskey over the last couple of years um, in, in barrel and, and it's maturing. You know, when we, when we first started, we didn't have our own bottling plant. We weren't allowed to, we had whiskey stored in various warehouses around Scotland. Uh, that all changed in 2016, 17, when we opened our own bottling plant in Edinburgh. And, and that has grown to significantly over the last couple of years. And it is a proper whiskey bottling, maturing, blending. Um, so we have a full warehouse facility up in Scotland, up in Edinburgh now, where we can actually mature, we can actually marry cask, we can actually do our blending. Um, so yeah, lots of exciting things have happened there. Uh, what we decided to do last year is rather than just keep pushing out whiskey, which is what we were doing without any fanfare at all, really just releasing parcels of, of bottlings as soon as they were bottled, we've actually started to collate them and create a series. So at the end of last year, we created our first ever world series, it's a collection of nine world whiskies from right around the world. And then we went into a big rye phase where we released nine young ryes from 11 months to four years old. Uh, quite, a, quite a brave thing to do, I think, but 11, uh, nine very, very different rye whiskies from America, from Europe, and the first ever Empire Rye blend. Now going forward this year, we've got another couple of selections or, or collections as we're calling them. And we've got off, we're really excited. We're just about to release uh, an Australian whiskey collection. So eight Australian distilleries that we've, um, so when we were last allowed to travel, went and visited Australia and a number of distillers uh, and came back with a collection of casks. Um, yeah, we've got a, because some more you know, English whiskey has grown significantly. And so we've got some pretty exciting English whiskeys coming up soon. Um, and a lot of finished with so whiskeys in various finishing, which is like a nice little collection. But all the time, we're always looking for great parcels of scotch. So in our most recent release of rye whiskeys, we had some cracking scotch whiskeys, some old grain from the Canvas distillery. We had a pair of Tobermory 12-year-olds from... Uh, the Isle of Mull, a Tobermory unpeated and an elliptic um, peated cask, so sister sister casks, and, also, and the oldest Glen Tockers we've ever I've ever found a forty four year old uh, single malt from the Glen Tockers Distillery. Yeah, it's old. I haven't found anything older, and I've been searching high and low uh, to see if anyone has bottled anything quite as old as that. So yeah, that was from before. That's from seventies, mid seventies. And not long after that, the, the Glen Tockers distillery was mothballed for a little while. So yeah, this is this sort of stuff is where I was rocking horse shit. But yeah, we've had some old tomatin, some old or frusks, um, and we released a forty-year-old blended Scotch as well, so, um, which was yeah. pretty cool. Very very exciting. I mean, uh, I want to say quick day to the people who are watching on the uh, on the Facebook. And if you do see me looking down, it's because I've got the the Facebook chat here, so I'm, I'm not ignoring anyone there. But um. G'day to, to, to James Vinnigan, who, who says g'day to, to Colby, to Michael, 
Dave, Gabrielle, everyone that's tuning in there as well as on the various um, social medias um, around. If you are watching on the YouTube as well, the YouTube comment section tends to be a pretty weird place, so I tend to stay away from that. So I, I tend to read them back afterwards. Um, it's, it's not safe to go to go there live. But um, I, I want to maybe um, now dive into the boutique, but I know that um, even though we're virtually and people can't physically throw things at me, I think if we go much further than 12 minutes into a tasting without letting people drink something, uh, they will they will call me and start abusing me. So I think um, for those who, who have a whiskey while we go through this, and again, you don't need to uh, drink everything, you know, scallop back straight away. Take your time with this one because um, it is quite delicate and quite light and, and fruity. But we're going to start with the the Tina Nick, um, which we'll talk about it in a, in a second. But um, for those who, who may not be familiar, um, some pretty weird labels um, or, or interesting labels that are going on with, with Boutique. Uh, do you want to maybe take us back about the um, about the ethos of Boutique and, and sort of where it is or, what, or it's how it's come to be rather? Sure. Yeah, while you're sipping this, nosing and sipping this, I mean, it is your whiskey, do what you want with it. Um, yeah, Boutique Whiskey entered the scene way back in September 2012 as an independent bottler. That means we don't buy, uh, make whiskey, we buy and bottle it. And it really did begin, we opened our account with a bit of a bang, with two single malts from arguably the most collectible Scottish distilleries, Ardbeg and Macallum and two single malts from long closed Scottish distilleries from, from Cappadonic, which closed in 2002, and Port Ellen, which closed in 1983. And, and right from the start, we wanted to be a little bit different. I think the, the most significant departure from convention was the labels. Uh, we didn't want to look the same as everybody else. We didn't want to look sort of traditional. We wanted a little bit of fun. We want to put some fun back in the whiskey. Whiskey's a drink. It's a, meant to be fun. You know, it's not uh, meant to be stuffy and collecting dust up on the shelf. So we we wanted a graphic novel style label that tells a story. Uh, and every label does tell stories about the distillery, about people who are associated with the distillery, or, or sometimes absolutely nothing at all. Um, but there is a, a little pictorial what we call graphic novel style labels. They're all done by one artist. Uh, Emily Chappell is her name. She's been with us right from the start. She has done probably around 200 different labels now. Uh, we've almost got 200 labels, I would have thought, from all the different distilleries. And certainly with all the custom labels that we've done for single cast bottlings for various distributors, customers, bars, um, <clears throat> And every distillery, so the Tininic label will always be the same, but it, there is one change between each batch. So you can recognize the bottle straight away by looking at the labels. Ah, oh, that's a Tininic, that's a Cotswolds. This is a Isla number three. Um, because the label will remain the same, there's just little tiny differences. It's a bit of a, where's, where's Wally, is it? You're picking out the little changes between each batch. So people will say, oh, I've had that one before. Well, they probably haven't because that was just the batch that we released last year. This is the new batch. It's a different age. It's a it's a different bottling strength. But it's a different cask. Um, so we say so an independent bottler, everything we do is small batch. Um, we never say single cask. Some of them will be, some of them won't be. It's not really that important to us. What's important is the quality of liquid in the glass. And we never state cask strength. Cask strength isn't necessarily the best bottling strength. Um, and we want it to be, you know, great right from the start. So we do cut most of our vattings or single cast down. Some of them will be single, uh, uh, will be will be cast straight. It's, again, we don't state it. It's not important to us. It's about the quality of that liquid that comes out. Uh, and just just for the record, there, if anyone had eight fifteen on their bingo cards, it's eight fifteen a.m. in the morning that Dave has taken his first uh, nose of whiskey. So, if you had eight fifteen <laughs> on your bingo card, that's uh, you, you're a winner there. <laughs> so, Tininic, this is our third batch. It's a 10 year old. We bottled this at 49.2% ABV. It was a release. That's quite a big release. This is uh, uh, 2,893 bottles when we when we bottled it up as 50, uh, 50 CL bottles. And obviously we've split that down into the minis on some of those because we went back and repurposed some of the bottlings afterwards when we thought about, oh, how about gifting? Um, <laughs> uh, we need to break them all down. Because if you bottle Scotch whiskey and call it, and label it Scotch whiskey, it all has to go back to Scotland to be drammed 
So our head office is, as Atom Group is down in Kent. And so whenever we get a bottle of whiskey and we decided we needed to dram it, it all has to go back. Certainly if it's for sale, um, we all, it all has to go back up to Scotland to be drammed. Um, and we've got, yeah, we've got all the equipment to do that pretty quickly now. Yeah. Have you, uh, I know that we, we, I did the panic and run around just on a little bit of a side note here of anything in 30 mil or 50 mil bottlings and, and, and that sort of thing, uh, pretty much as soon as lockdown hit and, in the past, Australia's been a bit of a prohibitive market for small miniature bottlings because they still cost a lot to ship over here and there's still a lot of weight and the glass doesn't cost that much cheaper compared to full-size bottlings. Are you guys bottling more 50 mil bottlings than you were in the past or is it pretty much stable? Um, the 50 mil bottlings is all new to Boutique. Really, um, that's a, the, the gifting idea came up as, as the company was growing. Um, right from the start, there was Drinks by the Dram, uh, which is a, a sister company or, from, or one of the smaller brands from um, Atom Group. Uh, and that's always been 30 mil packs, uh, 30 mil samples of all different spirits. Uh, and Boutique was drammed into that. But what the, 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 the fractional team wanted to do is create these proper Boutique kits. And so we have a number of tasting sets and and the wheel are they the only five cl bottlings that we do we have had the advent calendars in 30 mil samples so you get a, a box of 24 windows of joy as i call them uh, and then we have had those by, made by drinks by the dram and had our poster labels on them um sort of squeezed down so you can little tiny colorful labels rather than just the the plain drinks by the dram packaging so they've looked cool as well yeah yeah a uh, well, quick, quick shout out to speaking of, um, of new distilleries, uh, Michelle and or Mark Burns um, from Griffith with the Aisling Distillery. Um, got to try some of their new make for the first, uh, sorry, their uh, whiskey for the first time yesterday, last night, which was very, very good. Um, so looking forward to see what, what they do. But thank you guys for, for tuning in. Um, but let's let's uh, talk about this Teen Inic because this is a bit of a Discover boutique um, session and Teen Inic is not necessarily a distillery that you'd throw in, in front of someone as their first introduction into, into many things apart from the distillery itself. But it is one of my favourite um, distilleries, a, a one that I, I guess is a workhorse that gets does a lot of the work and none of the glory uh, for, for a lot of things. You very rarely see it bottled as a single malt. There is no official Tininic brand at all. It's one of, as you say, Diageo's workhorses. Lots of it goes into, all, almost all of it goes into blended Scotch whiskey. There is the 10-year-old flora and fauna from Diageo that you can find occasionally. It's not something that's everywhere. Um, it's a great whiskey. Even that, even that, even the flora and fauna series is a, is a wonderful series to grab hold of as well. Um, but this is... I say our fourth, fourth, third batch, uh, a 10 year old. Uh, it, it is a big workhorse distillery. It's almost unique in Scotland and certainly has been unique up until 2015 as it was the first distillery in Scotland to remove the mash tun and the old Porteous mill and fit a mash filter and a hammer mill, which allows a lot more efficiency. You know, the, the hammer mill means you can grind the, the grain up into a much finer um, flour. Uh, and you can get a lot more sugars out of the, the barley and their higher yield. So a mash filter, it, it was the only one in operation. So this is definitely new school um, Tininic. Anything before 2000, this was from 2008. Uh, and it, and it's, it's from a collection of hogsheads. The hogsheads are remade ex-bourbon barrels. So the ex bourbon barrels of 200 litres are shipped over to the over to the UK flat packed and they're rebuilt and made a little bit bigger into 250, which is what we call hoggies. Um, <clears throat> and nearly everything in Scotch whiskey is ex bourbon refill. Most of it is refill bourbon. Um, there are obviously small parcels of sherry casks and first fill obviously comes through occasionally as well. But the majority of Scotch and certainly tin in it will be in refill hoggies because nearly all of it's destined for blending but we don't think all of it should be destined for blending because i do make you know, every distillery you visit in scotland the people who work in a, in a distillery 
are really proud of the stuff that they make and they always think that their stuff is the best absolutely they're, they're so proud of what they do this is what i love about the industry everyone is so passionate about what they're doing uh, and they all want their their whiskies to be single more you know think they're the best which is what i love mm. Mm. I know, this I know, is really really fruity yeah i know it's it's your breakfast and not my breakfast but this is a breakfast whiskey like this is light it's it's got all that really luscious fruit uh, on the nose but it is a little bit cereally still on the palate you still get that yeah. that malt coming through um a, a distillery that and I, I love this element of of whiskey sometimes when you get very naked and honest expressions of the distillery in in the sense of there's not a huge amount of it's not been in a big sherry cask or a big port cask. You, you, you get that spirit character. It's still been in a barrel for 10 years, so it's still, you know, definitely softened and, and done its journey, but just such a, a beautiful take on, on that spirit character, very traditional. But, yeah, like, I don't know if I'm throwing this at wheat bix. I think I'm throwing this at porridge. I think there's too much too much fruit for wheat bix. I'm pouring this over my porridge instead. Oh, this could be a great pot. I, you know, putting putting a splash of whiskey in my porridge is one of my favourite things to do at the weekend, <laughs> at the winter. And they were very. I do like a little bit of smoke in my in my porridge. I must admit, a little bit of Isla smoke coming through. But yeah, I reckon this would be really lovely in in porridge. That fruitiness. I mean, it really does this this mash tun uh, mash filter technology gives an ultra clear word that gives that sort of a clue to that character, that grassiness, that very fragrant um, work. And then they have the big, big fat copper stills that give that oiliness that comes through. And it's that texture on the palate that you can taste that oiliness. It's not just really thin and light. It's, there's still some sort of meatiness on the palate. Yeah, yeah 100 percent. And for, for those who maybe haven't been to one of the Oak Barrel tastings before and um, you know, we're throwing a lot of different terms and, and things at you. This is part of the, the beauty of single malt scotch is that all these different elements, you can't look at a distillery on paper or at the like the blueprints or even walk in and have a look and say, this is going to taste exactly like this because everything plays in a, in a, a, a little bit of a different way, whether that's, you know, you, where you're talking about the filter of, of that's, you know, collecting you, your grains or siphoning them off, the, the shape of your still. And, and that's what's so great about Boutique, who've bottled almost – every operating Scottish distillery apart from some very new ones probably must be very close to um, there are, most I, there, there's, there are 95 established single malt distilleries in Scotland so that's everything older than Kilhoman going all the way back to Strathila I think is the oldest one so 77 of those 95 there are 31 new distilleries so everything obviously newer than Kilhoman and we bottled a couple of those new newer distilleries so <clears throat> We're, we're working our way through there. We've, I mean, our most recent uh, new Scottish distillery was Nucnean, uh, just a three-year-old Nucnean that sold out overnight. I didn't even get a chance to get a, a bottle of that first release that we've ever done. It was very, very well received. Um, yeah, Nucnean is a brand new distillery uh, released, and we got our a, a first ever independent bottling from them as well. So I think we just released ours about a month after their first ever release, which was pretty exciting. Yeah, it's, it's a distillery we, we've heard of and we've seen the labels, but we've had no access to in, in Australia yet. Um, but excellent. I mean, probably not, just going back to the tin and it, not the longest finish I've ever had on a whiskey, but it's a good medium sort of length. But this for me is the, the star is the nose. It's so fresh and flavorful. Um, I think I think the technical term is potentially Moorish is the word you, you're meant to say, uh, but this is dangerously smashable in the Australian vernacular. Uh, th this would go down a, quite quickly if you weren't paying attention, um, and certainly even for the first whiskey of the night does not feel like forty nine point two percent. You know, very, like essentially fifty percent doesn't feel that high. Yeah, I mentioned about cask strength or batch strength earlier. We, we try and bottle it at the perfect strength for drinking. It's all about balance, and we try and get that balance right in the bottle from the from the cask makeup. So this is obviously not a single cask with a batch of 2,000-plus bottles. Um, but the batch strength at 10 years old would have been a little bit higher than that 48.6, but that's where we thought it was best placed for drinking straight out. 
Um, if, if you're not used to the sort of higher strength, you can add a drop of water and adding a drop of water, do it, do it carefully because you can always add, but you can never take it back. Um, the easiest thing to do is use a teaspoon. I'll always have a teaspoon around and a glass of water and you can just add a tiny little bits into there and then see how it changes. And it will change on the, on the nose with a drop of water. That comes a lot, this is much more grassy now, very, very fragrant. It, it's, it's important, if, if we were talking about boutique gins and we are getting pineapple or yuzu fruit or cherry or whatever, it's because there has been yuzu fruit thrown into the gin or cherries thrown into the gin. When we're talking about whiskies, the only ingredients and particularly single malt whiskey is only malted barley, water, yeast, and if you want to call copper and an oak an ingredient, you can maybe count them. So all these these fruity flavors and all these different types of flavors we're getting are all you know esters and chemical compounds binding together. So when you add water into this situation, you are changing that chemical compound, and inevitably you would change the the aromas that you get off. So um, I always add whiskey. Uh, sorry, or I was about to say I always add whiskey to my whiskey, which uh, is also a true statement. But I do add. Uh, <laughs> I add water to every every whiskey I ever try. Um, some sometimes they get better. Sometimes I prefer them at their strength. And I think for those who are playing along tonight, that's the beauty of having fifty mil bottles. Is you can go back to it and you say I, I added a bit of water. It wasn't my thing. Beautiful. Don't need to do it the second time or vice versa. Added a bit of water and it was perfect. You know exactly what to do the, the next time around. Um, should we move on to number about, two now? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Should we just quickly talk about the label? Uh, yes, I totally forgot about that. A very good label as well. One of my favourite labels. <clears throat> yeah, this is a, a, a little view within the church. Um, and it is based upon a true love story from many years ago about Captain Hugh Monroe, who was the founder of the distillery. He was shot in the head behind the eyes, uh, lucky enough to survive. However, he lost his eyesight in the process. And that's him sitting at the front on the left there with the little green glasses. Um, his sweetheart, who he was due to marry just before he was shot, uh, was forbidden to marry him uh, as he, her father didn't want her marrying a disabled man. And so she ended up marrying somebody else. And Captain Hugh Monroe went on about living his life. And, and this is a scene in, 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 the, in the church there. She wanted to see him one last time. She always carried a torch for... Uh, Captain Hugh, she always carried a, a torch for him. So that here she is sitting in the back in the pew crying. Um, and it is, it is a true story. It's a very, very sad, true story. Uh, she's there weeping one last time before she died or before he died. Um, and yeah, this is this is the label for Tin in it. Now the little changes that happen every time are the little bow on the girl's hair here changes colour or the little feathers. So it's little, little tiny little changes that you're looking for on each batch. Now the little priest, vicar, rector standing here on a box because in a little All Blacks shirt was our, our marketing director or is our marketing director. He's now just left us actually. He's a, he is a little Kiwi um, and he's, his name is Nick Ravenhall. And so he's a teeny Nick. A teeny <laughs> Nick, and there he is on his little box because we've made him very teeny. He's not tiny at all. I mean, Nick is uh, <laughs> a bit of an athlete, um, an open water swimmer, and yeah. But it, but it's our little little pun, a little joke, and we try and feature people who work on the in within the company on the labels. Uh, so lots of our labels have features where we've hidden someone, an employee, on the. Uh, I've actually, I've actually got a bit of a bone to pick with you on this label because we, we did a, a lot of public virtual tastings, but we also did a few like private tastings for for groups of mates or family had birthdays and things last year and they couldn't get into the same state. And you'd sort of say, oh, what we can do is we do boutique and they do these really fun labels and they're, they're really cool and there's something a little bit different. And if we ever did this, we would have to be first and then you tell this really sad story. He was like, you said they're all going to be fun, uplifting, funny labels. I was like, oh, yeah, starting with the, the saddest story of all. That, uh, but um, bloody good, <laughs> bloody good whiskey. And it's a great story. It's just not a particularly happy one. It's a lovely story, really. But, um, yeah, it's a true story. And um, the guy survived. Uh, in fact, you can find um, references to Captain Hugh Monroe in a lot of uh, whiskey documentation going back uh, in the day. 
which is quite amusing. I'll pop, pop the tasting notes up here uh, for an hour, and you can see the difference in the label here, because that was the first batch, there's the second, uh, the third batch, and you see that colour of that little ribbon change there. So that's our, our own tasting notes, lots of ripe fruits at first. Um, I don't know, tasting notes are very, very personal. Um, everyone will get slump, something slightly different, but um, that's a standard tasting notes from us on there if you're interested. Beauty. Mm. It's almost certainly, and I do get asked this question a lot because the oak barrel is moving increasingly to the bottles you see on our shelves and on our website are independent bottlers, whether it's boutique or other brands. And a lot of people do ask the question is like, how do you choose what goes on the shelf in terms of you might just be looking at a lineup? Um, and if I see tin and from anyone, uh, particularly independent bottlers that I, I trust and, and know um, that they're going to be in quality, I just jump on it straight away because tend to be exceptional whiskies. Tin not necessarily a distillery that people are out panic buying and collecting and selling at auction sites for silly dollars. So they still represent exceptional value for what they are. Um, but I just love everything about that distillery. It's not, as, as you, you mentioned with the, the, the mash filter, it's pretty, pretty modern. In, in what it's doing. And that's a very expensive bit of equipment to, to talk about then higher yields and a flavor profile and that sort of thing. But um, basically, if, if if I see in a list of what's the new boutique range and teen in there, yep, done, beautiful, straight away, grab it. And that goes for a lot of people because I think they're just very, very good whiskeys and, and very, very unassuming whiskeys as well. Yep, I agree. Yeah, those, those sort of workhorse distilleries that you don't often, you very rarely see bottled by the distillery just apart from the deep flora and fauna range or something like that are always interesting to whiskey geeks because you don't find them you know you don't see them and so when an independent bottler and generally you know m most independent bottlers you know they won't put any rubbish in a bottle because it's more than their their brand is worth you know if you start putting rubbish into bottles as an independent bottler you won't be around for very long yeah I'm, I'm just going to duck um, because when I opened this space side, the next whiskey, I dropped the lid. And as much as I'd like it to be one of those bottles that you throw the lid away and finish, I do have two more after this. So I'm just going to duck and find that lid very quickly. But this, this whiskey is uh, perhaps notable because there is no distillery name on it. We, we know it says the word single malt. So we know it's come from a single distillery, but there's no distillery yeah. name on it, unless it was the space side distillery. But that's another story. Yeah, it's not the Speyside Distillery because it is, uh, it's not the Speyside label. And this is a Speyside single malt. Now, sometimes when you buy whiskey from distilleries, they will dictate whether you can name it or not. Sometimes when you buy whiskey through brokers, they will do the same. So the cask will be labelled as what distillery it came from, but there may be instructions from the seller that you cannot name it because they're protecting their brand. So sometimes we can named distilleries and sometimes we can't it's simple as that and that depends where you buy it from now we buy whiskey from three sources when we first started uh, you know scotch whiskey industry is unique it was founded on the back of blended scotch whiskey and so there are big brokerages um, that store that buy new make they invest in new make spirit and they sell it for the blending houses it's all destined for blenders or independent bottlers uh, and that's where you buy the majority of your Scotch whiskey through brokers. Now that's changed over the eight years that we've been around um, in that we are now have these direct contacts with distilleries and we can buy stock direct from the distilleries. Um, and we also buy a, a whiskies from private collectors. Now this is from a undisclosed Speyside distillery. It's a, a big batch, um, just six years old. Uh, a, a, a batting of sort of hoggies and sherry butts. And we bottled this at 49.3% ABV. Now, we're not allowed to name this one, but the clues are all on the label. So uh, it's very it's very straightforward, really, to find, but it's just not allowed to name it because Glen Rothers won't tell us. Um, oh, that was... Uh, um, six I, was, I, was, I, was about, I was about to say... Um, it's, it's easy to find if you know what to certainly Google and uh, and look for and, and the, the theme behind the story. And we'll, we'll do that when you bring up that slide. Um, or you just wait for Dave to accidentally say it. And that's that's the other way that you can find out. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I hope, you, I hope you're all we listening can't. carefully then. 
can't put it in writing, but I might just oops, slip it out. Now, there were 46 established Speyside distilleries, and just about each and every one of those has been up and running while this was distilled. So that leaves us 46 it could be from. Um, now, Speyside whiskies have always been favoured amongst the blenders. Um, yeah, many of these distilleries were initially built by blenders. You know, 90% of the world's Scotch whisky today is blended Scotch whisky. So the majority of the single malts still are heading into the blends. You know, most people don't drink, most whisky drinkers don't drink whisky out of blend cans. They drink it out of bigger glasses, taller glasses, where's my water glass? You, 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 you can reach for the mug. Us Australians know about drinking whisky out of mugs. You can reach for the mug. That's fine. Yeah. Always blow. Always blow when you're drinking on a Zoom call. Yeah. So they know it's hot. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's have a look at the label. Let's go through the clues, shall we? And uh, that'd be the easiest thing. Because our, our label here is a toast to the ghost. And there are ghost stories with a few distilleries. Um, and this is where the clues come in. And there is a ghost on our Glenrothes label. And uh, it is by way... So everyone loves a good ghost story. And so our label features a number of distillery ghosts in a graveyard making a toast. There's a few ghosts you may recognize. Uh, Glendronax, Spanish lady there in the red. That's uh, a ghost story from the Glendronac distillery. Glendronac is not considered a Speyside distillery. So we can safely discount Glendronac. There's Bemore's Headless Horseman. As we know, Bemore is the oldest distillery in Isla. So Isla, nowhere near Speyside, so it's definitely not a Bemore. Now in the middle there, there's Byway, Biawa Makalaga. Uh, said to have haunted Glenrothes Distillery. Now Byway was picked up in Africa uh, as a young lad by Major Grant. Um, an orphaned boy and he was brought back to the UK and the Grant family of um, the Glen Grant um, distillery looked after him all of his life. He stayed in the house there long after the major died uh, and he became a bit of a superstar of the village. He was played for the local football team um, and he's buried in the graveyard above Glen Rothes distillery. And when the distillery was extended, um, there were reported sightings of the ghost uh, but a byway coming up and haunting. And they got someone in and said, that, oh, your new distillery was built across a, a ley line and they moved the ley line and that was the last they saw of byway. Um, there's the Fair Maid of Galloway. Uh, I can't find any reference to the Fair Maid of Galloway in any distilleries, although there was a story that she was seen in, in Balvenie Castle, but I can't find that, which I don't think, you know, Balvenie is definitely Speyside. And there's Glen Scotia's Duncan McCallum, who um, disappeared into, I think he disappeared into a vat and drowned in, 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 into, a, into a vat of, um, of work. So yes, it is our little um, Glen Rothers. Uh, Byway features on our Glen Rothers label and he features on this label here. So that's the clue that we're not allowed to name. They're in the graveyard above um, the Glen Rothes distillery. So yes, it is, of course, um, from that distillery. Again, most of the stuff built for blending. When I visited, uh, Glen Rothes was a brand, uh, but 95% was going towards blends at that time. That was a few years ago, back in 15, 16, at 95% of this distillery. It's a big distillery, makes a lot of whiskey, big, big fat stills. Um, all goes to blends. It, yeah, that was for a long time the home of Cutty Sark blended Scotch whiskey. Uh, they had a little Cutty Sark museum there. There are no visitors centre, but um, there was a little Cutty Sark display that when you did get taken around there, you could go and have a look around at Cutty Sark. That's all changed now. Um, I think the, the thing that stands out for me, um, even before I dive into those tasty notes, is this is a six year old whiskey, which to you know, is not an incredibly big number when you think of traditional scotch. It's an old number when you think about Australian whiskey or something like that, but it doesn't drink like a, a young whiskey. It's, it's very, very, um, very round, very Moorish. And, um, you know, 
if I was to mention the name of the distillery that we think this all might be, that whiskey's house style for me has been this beautiful texture and this beautiful creaminess on the mid palate, um, probably coming from those those nice large stills. And I think that's a big part of this whiskey as well. Uh, and, and that's sort of what it's to so, And so to, to, to Reza, um, who's just commenting on the chat, yes, we were using the, the first label as a bit of example. Now we've switched over to the second slide now, which is the six-year-old 49.3%. Um, so th this is the one we're drinking, but it, it it's a remarkable whiskey for its its age, and, and I mean that just happens sometimes, doesn't it? Certain barrels seem to mature quicker than others. Yeah, it, it, you know the whiskeys that we that, that, that Nicknean only three years old and releasing three year olds, and we've got a three year old coming up a little bit later. Yes, it does. You know the, the whiskey will mature. Obviously, there's a lot younger casks in here than maybe the tin in it because there's a lot. There's there's, there's a marriage of, of of hoggies and 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 butts here. So there'll be some sherry butts giving it that a um, little bit darker colour, a little bit fruitier. I, I yeah, definitely get a... I definitely get the citrus on the mid palate. I don't get too much citrus on the nose. Um, and even though it says smokiness in the notes, I, I maybe get like a wood char, but not necessarily a smokiness. And that, that's just me. Yeah. That's my personal thing. Um, it's a it's a cask it's a cask smoke. It's a wood smoke rather than a peat smoke. It should have been uh, more should have been explained a little bit. Yeah, but you, you know, smokiness comes from the malt when we get to the the peated malts, or it could come from from a, from a, a heavily toasted cask, and you can get that smokiness coming through that wood smoke. I've just added some water to this. Just a, a bit of a segue here that's not specific about this whiskey, but about whiskey in general. We, since the late 80s, in, in Scotch whiskey, been talking about regions, Speyside, Highland, Lowland, Isla, Islands, a little bit later on Campbelltown. From, from, from my point of view, and I think from the Australian whiskey drinker's point of view, if Speyside is meant to taste like light and fruity and fragrant and Isla is meant to taste like big and smoky and peaty, that's a little bit irrelevant now because you get whiskies from Isla that are completely unpeated and not smoky. And you get whiskies from Speyside, which are big and heavy and peated. From, from your point of view on the ground in Scotland there, are the, the regions still being pushed by the distilleries themselves as we are proudly Speyside, we are proudly, or is it starting to die away a little bit? I, I think, you know, th those regions are a point in history are really for taxation, you know, but the Highland line, taxation, Lowland line, uh, it's always about taxation beforehand. Um, I think the distilleries like that regional grouping. You know, we're proudly space size. Certainly when it comes to whiskey festivals, the Isla Fe Festival, the Campbelltown Festival, the Highland Whiskey Festival, the, they've all got regional festivals. And the month of May in Scotland is generally one week after the other, all the way from... Speyside at the beginning, end of April, beginning of May, to finishing up on Isla at the end of May, beginning of June, you know, and, and everything in between. There's a Highland, there's a Lowland, there's there's everything in between, and the Campbelltown. Um, so, I think they still hanging on to that. But yes, I think regional, although we all do it, uh, we all re regionalise it ourselves. But you're right; you can make a heavily peated um, Isla style whisky or a Highland style whiskey in Speyside. It depends where you get the, the, the malted barley from. You can make those Isla whiskies in the middle of Speyside if you're bringing in Port Ellen maltings. Um, but if you're using um, the, the maltings at Glenord or something like that, you're, you're probably bringing in Highland peat, which would be a very different style of peated whiskey, like Ardmore, for example, is not Isla style of, of Highland whiskey. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the regionals, I think we're trying to sort of break it down onto flavours more more so than than regional. But when we're not allowed to name a distillery, it's much easier just to call it Highland, Speyside, Isla, um, because it, 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 it makes it much easier to guess than out of ninety five distilleries if you've only got to pick from forty or twenty or three or whatever it is. Yeah, it makes it a little bit more more simple. Now sometimes we don't actually know. There are a number of cases where we have not been even told what the distillery is. So it's been on strict instructions from the seller to the broker that, you, sorry, you can taste it and we can tell you it is a single malt and this is when it was distilled and it does come from this region, Highland, Speyside, Isla, 
but you cannot know the name. Uh, and we buy it completely unnamed. Um, we've got a couple out there at the moment that are completely unnamed. Generally, we do know. Uh, generally, we put a few clues on the label because we're just not allowed to put it in writing. But there are times where we seriously do not know. And we have, you know, good guesses. Uh, but we, you know, we can't say yes. It's definitely a, a Balbeni or a Glen Morangi. Um, it's what we think it is. And then someone else will come and say, oh, I think it's a Glen Livet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it tastes like a Macallan to me. So now you've got three in the ring. And, oh, it doesn't matter. Is it great whiskey? Yes, it is great. So that's why we bottled it. Yeah, 100%. And I think, again, this sort of strips away perception. Spaceside, six years old. Now, that could be a lot of different things considering all the distilleries in space and the different things they make and some mature quicker than others and all that sort of stuff it could be absolutely anything until you try it. And then it shows itself. And I think that's just such a, a beautiful thing when sometimes as whiskey drinkers, we can get hung up and I like this style and not that style. I like these distilleries and not those distilleries to throw all of that away and just go this. And as you say, if it was absolute rubbish, then it would have gone into a blend and no one would have bottled it. But obviously it's not because someone has got to to bottle it and other whiskey drinkers. And we may, if we didn't do a Zoom chat with, with you tonight, we may not know the team behind Boutique. We may not be able to speak to them, but we know they are whiskey lovers and they've decided to bottle it. So I think that's a really great element. I just, I haven't tried this whiskey, I think, since we did it almost 10, nine, 10 months ago when I think it was the second tasting. But just that oiliness, that viscosity around the side of my mouth, I just, and as as you know, Dave, like I'm, I'm a big fan of, texture in whiskeys up oh, flavors are great but when i drink a whiskey you know there's cheaper ways to get drunk right so like i, I want the experience <laughs> of all of it I, I want to i want to feel that weight i want to feel that that grippiness or that dryness or whatever it is and this is just one that i think you could you can sit on i know we, we spoke just before we went live we were working out a lineup and i did um and ah which whether this should be second or third because in my head i knew it was big but i didn't exactly remember it but i think the next one just on the the level of what the cask has done might is why we went this way. But I think in, in many other tastings, this would be you know, like second last, you know, right, right down towards the end of the tasting. Cause it's a really stately sort of, uh, uh, what's, what's the word? Like really luscious, really voluptuous whiskey. It is. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a cracking for, for a six year. I mean, we haven't bought a lot of this. I mean, a, a lot of our labeled Glen Rothers are much, much older that we bought obviously we bought that from long ago brokerage so distilleries change hands with owners and, and rules change as what you can and what you can't do um but um yeah I, it's just it's a cracking little whiskey for a six-year-old is that just i mean and every barrel is different because every barrel would have come from a different tree and maybe a different distillery previously or different bodega or whatever is it just a pure luck thing or is this maybe matured in a, a warehouse that maybe was hotter or something like what, what can force a whiskey to be this exceptional when arguably any other Glen Rothes we might've tried might be singing at 12 to 15 years old. Yeah. Um, we see most, majority of this stuff. Uh, like I said, 90, when I visited a, little, a few years ago, 95% of the whiskey there was just literally going out to brokerages, out to warehouses around Scotland to be blended away into cuddy sarks, into the supermarket blends. Um, and so, you know, most supermarket blends are just above three year old. There's not much whiskey much older than three years old. It's, you know, the bottom shelf sort of blends. And so everything in between, um, these, these casks are sitting there and we have a great we have we have great buying team and who have got a great network of connections and so when they're tasting casks uh, they're saying oh you might be interested in this we think this is um they've got a parcel here of from this distillery we think it's absolutely cracking do you want some samples of it um that's basically we've got a great team great connections that's how it's how it's happening where in you know where this has come from i have no idea um we just taste everything. Now, this is, so the six-year-old is the youngest whiskey in there. There may be some older in the makeup. I didn't, I didn't not everything would that. have been dis, not everything would have been distilled on the same day. And that's 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 the beauty of boutique is that we can do that sort of thing. You know, as an independent bottler, it doesn't matter to us. You know, if we put a if we bought some twenty-year-old 
um, uh, any distillery, Glen Lovett, uh, and um, Glen Blend it. And uh, we had a bucket of 10 year old and thinking actually that 10 year old will liven that up. Let's chuck, chuck in a bucket of 10 year old in there and now call it a 10 year old whiskey. We can do that. Okay, the price will be high for a 10 year old whiskey, but it's all about getting that balance of flavors, uh, 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 ABV, all of those sort of things that we want that mouthfeel, that texture, those flavors. We want to bring everything together. Um, and, and as an independent bottler, we would do that. Yeah just like it would happen in the distilleries many, many years ago before accountants came in. <laughs> you know, those 10, those 10 year olds had a proportion of old whiskey. Now I probably not, that's a bit unfair to accountants because there was a lot of old stock for a while. If you remember, you know, during the, the whiskey lock years of the eighties, there was a lot of older stock hanging around. And so that had to be used in a supermarket whiskey shop blends, 10, 12 year olds um, use the older stuff because we need to get rid of it. Yeah. And I think it's just another point on, on boutique is, um, you know, this this could have been a non-age statement whiskey and passed off as, oh, it's, yeah, I don't know, but it's a 15-year-old. But I like that transparency as well um, to sort of throw away those conceptions of I don't really care what the age is. The youngest is it, in it is six by the SWA, the Scotch Whiskey Association law. So that's what it is. But um, yeah, I, I think it's a whiskey that uh, it changed a lot of people's perception on on young scotch, particularly from distilleries like this. But very, very good. And I think as we go through tonight, we could we could stay along on this one. But this is one to come back to maybe even after the last, as we log off it. When you're sitting at home by yourself at eleven o'clock, if you've got a little bit left, go back to this one. I reckon this could be very good as a nightcap. Um, Definitely. Going to and we've spoken about youth and and uh, and that sort of thing. Going to a whiskey that's now half the age essentially of of this one. Um, which is, if you haven't seen the list there, is, is the Cotswolds, as my focus goes in and out, which is an English whiskey of all things, which up till about 15 years ago would have been heresy. I would have been kicked out of this, the industry. Yes, English whiskey has grown significantly over the last 15 years. Uh, Cotswolds is a fairly new-ish distillery. This is a three-year-old. It is the brainchild of Daniel Zors, who acquired an estate with two stone buildings on it. Now, this little estate in this tiny little village in the Cotswolds in the middle of nowhere, I mean, pretty difficult to find, I must admit, very, very skinny roads. Uh, there was a little parcel of land at the bottom of this village that had planning permission to build an industrial estate, a little industrial estate. And the owner of this land started building lovely Cotswold stone buildings and looked remarkably like a private estate. Nothing to do with um, industrial estate. They look like accommodation. Now, the planning committee came down and said, uh, this doesn't look like an industrial estate. These look like accommodation. We want to stop you building um, and stopped him building and there was a long standoff between the two and he said well I'll just leave it go derelict then uh, and Daniel found this parcel this this land with these buildings on uh, and persuaded the owner to sell it to him and um, turned these buildings into a distillery so yeah the, the, the visitor center looks remarkably like a, a lovely stone cottage uh, and the big building at the back that's been extended again would have been a big house but it's been extended into the still and he's built a, a little distillery in the middle of nowhere and has become an award-winning distiller mostly with uh, certainly with his gin because he needed to distill something he needed to raise funds so he started making gin because it's a cash cow and uh to keep him going before he could sell his first ever whiskey and he bottled his first ever whiskey first whiskey was actually bottled at the paris whiskey live they had casks over there, and on the Whiskey Live day that it opened in Paris that day, it, the distillery was three years old, and they were literally pumping out the casks into the bottles to get ready for the show that morning. I remember tasting their first ever bottling of whiskey. Um, so both whiskey and gin started production on the same day back in 2014. So in 2017, they became three years old. Now, Jim Swan was one of the influencers here. He was one of the advisors. Um, can that's I where just, we get a lot of this. just say for any uh, younger viewers here, the word influencer means something a little bit different to what Jim Swan was doing, as opposed to the people who uh, run Instagram accounts. We're, we're talking about an actual real life 
consequential influencer when we talk about Jim Swan? Jim Swan is a legend, or was a legend, and is, is still a legend in the industry. Um, he sorted, he, his touch goes across the globe at distilleries where he went in, just like you have Bill Lark in Australia who's touched so many distilleries and found, you know, brought Australian distilling back up to speed. Uh, Dr. Jim Swan, uh, a lifetime in the industry, retired and then set himself up as a consultant um, and sorted companies out, you know, distilleries out like Cavalan um, in, in Taiwan, but all around the globe, there's his his touch. Um, STR car shaved, toasted and recharged casks, um, something that he was working on. So distilleries in Israel, distilleries in Taiwan, distilleries in across the UK, um, there's not many distilleries he hasn't touched. And uh, it's it's funny you you you're talking about when we talk about Tina Nick, the the pre and post style that they had with that that mash filter. I know there's distilleries a little bit like Amarut, like Warren Heim, who do the Amarut whiskey in Brittany, and they almost have pre and post Jim Swan build a distillery, start production, and then he kind of, they bring him along, and he goes, well, I'd maybe do this and maybe do that a little bit different, and they're just the the new make spirit and the whiskey they produce in five, six years time, you know, this is after we change things and there's a, a noticeable difference that I, I've seen in, in a lot of distilleries that he touched. Yeah, it becomes all of a sudden, yeah, you, you get certainly that Amoric in, in France, there is, I remember tasting the old stuff, pre, pre, pre Jim Swan and the new stuff and there is that really noticeable difference to the quality level, the mouthfeel, everything is, yeah, mediocre whiskey. Wow, this is this is something good. Yeah, he, he he did have that magic touch. He was passionate about what he did. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so I think he he might be represented on the label in a not so subtle uh, turn. And be, even before uh, people pick, get the slides up, you might be able to pick up your bottle and just see where would Jim Swan be represented on? Or sorry, Doctor Jim Swan, the late Doctor Jim Swan, be represented on that label? I think it's a pretty pretty obvious one that one. So, sometimes yeah. they're subtle, sometimes they're not so subtle. Yeah, we, we've been um, hiding, or not hiding, we've been putting a swan on the label of every distillery that uh, Dr. Jim has had a hand on. So on our, on our Welsh, our Pendarum, the swan is on a signet, on the golden signet ring of the artist's hand. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's hidden amongst our, our labels. And this one here is, yeah, we put a typical Cotswolds sort of scene on the on the label it's a it's a midsummer murders theme um if you've heard of midsummer murders over there it's a very cheesy uh, detective series detective barnaby solving these very posh murders you know, they're all nearly all wealthy miserable bastards um on these I, I actually sat and watched a few of them i just wanted to watch some shit tv the other day when i wasn't feeling too good and uh, there's just they just continually run on one channel, one after the other, and they're just all the same. But um, yeah, this... I'm, I'm, I'm more of a touch of frost and foils war man myself, I have to admit. But I, I, I'm partial yeah. to an odd midsummer. Yeah, well, this is the midsummer murder scene on the label. There, you've got Daniel waving cheerily. It's sort of a sort of a '90s '30s style poster. Come to the Cotswolds holiday, sort of thing. And it's Daniel with a big cheery grin outside his Land Rover. Now, if you look really careful, and I'll put the slide up in a minute, there's a dead body hiding under the bush, and there's a smoking gun. Um, that's the Midsummer Murders theme, and Daniel loves this little story here because there are obviously this little tiny Cotswolds village, and there are people who complain about everything. Uh, when anything's thinks, you know, planning permissions put through, I want to do a different, you know, most people have, you know, Daniel has become a real pillar of the community of this little town that he's adopted, little tiny village that he's adopted. Um, and they've got hundreds of volunteers queuing up, wanting to bottle, bottle their, you know, they have volunteers come and bottle the gin and stuff like that when they first started. I don't know if they're still doing that now, but there's always someone who complains about everything in the village you know there's someone i want to put a i want to paint my door blue and someone oh no you can't paint it blue that's just not traditional sort of thing and so that dead body represents the people in the village that complain about everything uh and so that's that's his little he, he loves that little story there so what else can i tell you about the cotswolds well they use the oldest maltings UK working maltings, floor maltings in the UK, Warminster maltings. So everything is floor malted. They use local grains. 
um, they're using some heritage grains, but they're using local grains throughout. Um, the malt is milled, so obviously they don't malt the old uh, the, the barley at their own place. It's a very, very tiny place, but they do mill everything there and they've got a pair of stills and they use two strains of dried yeast. Uh, for fermentation. They use a very, very long ferment, not very, very long, but 90 hours. So that's a long in the industry. And that allows those fruity flavours that Dr. Jim Swan to call those esters, let them get in. It's one of Dr. Jim's master strokes, that long fermentation for the fruitiness of a young spirit. Now, really interestingly, I was just talking to Nick Meehan, um, who we just bottled recently. And Dr. Jim was a a major influence in setting up that distillery. And he created a new make spirit for a very short maturation period. And Annabelle, the founder of the distillery said, well, what about if I want to make, you know, I want to leave some whiskey for 10 years. I want a 10 year old McNee. And she said, oh, well, don't use that. You need to do a different new make um, spirit. Yes, I'll put the label up, sorry. I'll do um, And if, if other people, I know there's, there's a couple of people that I think have, um, things they're jumping in and out of this this will all be live on the facebook and youtube after after this sorry it recorded so you can go back and watch it and pause pause the uh, the panels as, as you need to um if if so as you wish you need to jump in and out but um yeah we'll bring up the slide now i should be it's not coming up one minute um let's close that and do our try me, again and, and before the tasty notes come up as dave's working on that they're like very very different to the first two whiskies like you can tell that not only is potentially the cask has been mature and matured and been different, but the um, the the approach to the whiskey maisky is very different because texturally and and in its DNA it it feels and and tastes different. So this has been matured in a red wine barrique. Uh, yeah, the the toasted. Charge STR casks, shaved, toasted, and recharred ex red wine casks. So the wine hasn't had a major influence on it. It hasn't really eaten into it, but it has that fruitiness that comes through there. It's it's something we see a lot in these uh, uh, whiskey, and I hesitate to say the word new world, but maybe like a a new world, a, like mental approach rather and, and technical approach rather than countries. But we see it a lot in Australia, a lot in places like Taiwan, in um, places like India and places like England. These new world, new new approach producers is using these red wine casks. So it's um, it, it doesn't surprise me at all when the Cotswolds comes up to see it in, in new world and you get that luscious red berry sort of fruity note. There's there's a bit of spice and I think that's probably coming from that 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 char that that Jim Swan influence. Um, we, we can see you get that like that bit of uh, you know oat char and a little bit like the old woodworking room sort so, sort of note when you you probably haven't cleaned it up as well as you should have in uh, in year ten, but yeah, I think the dominant thing for me is that big ripe red fruit on the nose. Yeah, yeah, we had this 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 one featured in our. In, in the tasting I did at the weekend in Canada, and uh, it surprised a number of people how what a three-year-old whiskey. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I had to put this one on because I was uh, away um, when you did this in our series of boutique tastings last year, and I um, when I when I came back and, and Joey, I believe it was, who filled in for me that that night, and he said, "I was like, what was the favourite out of the ones you did?" I was like, "Well, I think the Cotswold actually won." that that bracket of whiskies we did that night so it's like ah oh. so I've, I've tried it subsequently but i wanted to had to do it tonight so i could hear you talk about it yeah i i love what they're doing there i mean it's it's probably the closest distillery to me here in in just north of london so i can I'm probably about midway between the english whiskey company in st george's over in norfolk and 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 the banbury distillery uh in the cotswolds I probably there's, there's smaller distilleries now in Oxford that probably are a little bit closer to me, but these are the two sort of major English whiskey distilleries. They're bigger production distilleries, um, and I love going to visit this little place. Uh, the New Make Spirit in both of those distilleries is absolutely superb to drink straight off the still. It is just so flavourful. Um, 
the people are great. Yeah, the, 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 the English whiskey is really looking good um, with the, the three major players of, of the Lakes English Whiskey Company and, uh, and the Cotswolds. And there's lots of smaller companies that are all doing some really great stuff as well. They're all just about coming of age. Um, so, yeah, the English whiskey scene is, is looking vibrant. There's a, there's actually um, a, a bit of news that came out in Australia last week, is that the uh, a, 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 the Bimber Distillery, which is quite urban in London, it's actually co-owned by an Australian expat, um, have got distribution into Australia. So um, we really only see English Whiskey Company and Cotswolds in small amounts, but we'll see Bimber as well um, at some point this year. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Australian market takes to, to English whiskey. Imba has been doing some fabulous stuff, but it is very, very small scale in what they're doing. Um, so it's not something that's, yeah, I think, I think most of the stuff is, is, is single cast stuff. And uh, yeah, they've just got a very small direct fired still, uh, beautiful looking thing. Um, but at a, at, on a scale of how they can scale it up, I'm not sure if they can at the moment, but yeah, I think it's something that they need to start thinking about. And uh, because, they, yeah, they've been making some bloody excellent stuff over here. There, there's a great buzz for, for Bimba over here. But because of what they're, it's, it's such a small scale, everything that they produce and bottle is, is highly desirable. And you know, there's loads of people who want to grab their hands on it and it disappears really quickly. It's a bit of a bun fight every time they do a release over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll see some of that and... Maybe it, we, we've never done an, an English exclusive whiskey tasting here at the Oak Barrel, either physically or virtually, but maybe it's something we can look at uh, midway through this this year. If, if they come in and there's a few others around, that could be quite interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Scottish purists might burn the place down, but we'll get over that. I uh, yeah, we, we bottled our first batch of English whiskey quite a few years ago now, a five-year-old English whiskey, um, a marriage of three casks, um, bourbon, sherry, and a bit of peat. And so it was, it was a really quality whiskey. And when I was doing the tastings as I was visiting clubs all around, up and down the country, I would always do them blind. So I'd peel the labels off and I'd make boutique labels specific for each club. So Glasgow Whiskey Fair Club, uh, I think the first one I did was um, the one in London. Oh, I can't remember. They always do their tastings blind. And I've been to a number of their um, tastings and they always put the bottles in socks. And I thought, well, I don't, not, not, not socks, but, you know, velvet bags with numbers on. I thought, well, I really don't want to hide the bottles. Um, I want to have the brand there. I want boutique whiskey there so you can see it. Uh, and so I made these custom labels and that was the first that we just numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. And that was the first time I took these blind tones. I thought, this is what I'm going to adopt to every whiskey club I did. But uh, I managed to sneak an English whiskey, our first English whiskey, into the Glasgow Whiskey Club uh, under my blind tasting. And I, I seduced them with uh, a Port Dundas, I think it was, a 20-year-old Port Dundas, that our first 25. Uh, I seduced him with a lovely local grain and then I put them, took them on a journey to Speyside and we ended up in a Tormor with a lovely 23 or 21 year old Tormor. And I sneaked this five year old English in at number four and uh, they loved it until I told them what it was in the Glasgow Whiskey Club. Unfortunately, I knew a lot of the people in, in the Glasgow Whiskey Club by then, but there was bloody uproar. I, <laughs> you bought an English whiskey into the Glasgow Whiskey Club after they're telling me they loved it. You know, yeah, it's 10, 12, 18 years old. Reminds me a bit of Highland Park, you know, all these sort of comments coming through. And I told them it was an English whiskey, this bloody hot raw. So I said, right, I grabbed my coat and said, right, I'm off now and walked out. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, we did, I did come back and finish it. But yeah, I sneaked uh, an English whiskey into the Glasgow Whiskey Club, I think. I'm sure they, they loved it. And a few of them have come back and told me that they actually went out and bought some English whiskey afterwards because they thought it was so good. Um, but they always remind me every time I see them, oh, he's a bloody, he's the guy that bought a bloody English whiskey in the Glasgow <laughs> Whiskey Club. You know, they always remind me. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just like if, if you're a, you know, a footy fan, like, like love all footy. Don't just pick a code. It's like, love all whiskey. There's, there's a whiskey out there for everyone. And, you know, from all across the world, like we, we, we see a big divide here 
um, in terms of like your American whiskey consumer and your Scotch whiskey consumer. And I'm very proud and happy to say that in the last five years, and it's not just the Oak Barrel, but across the Australian market, that that almost militaristic divide is becoming a little bit blurred now and you're getting bourbon, hardcore bourbon drinkers buying scotch and hardcore scotch drinkers buying bourbons and rice. So it's um, it's good. It's an exciting time for whiskey. Yeah, it is. Yeah, don't discount anything. Try everything. You know, I can't come these people that come up to me and say, I look at the row because as an independent bottler, we can't have the distillery name in big letters right across our, our label because we have to state it's boutique whiskey is what we are in our brand. And so what we have is big letters of single malt whiskey or single malt Scotch whiskey or single malt English whiskey or blended malt. And that's the first thing people see is the picture. And then as you can see on the light on the English label, it says single malt English whiskey. And when you've got a blend, you've got to call it a blend. And that's the biggest writing on there. And you get these people coming up the whiskey show. I'll, I'll try one of your single malts. I don't do blends. And so the first thing they've done is they've just seen it's blended malt Scotch whiskey. I don't drink blends. I said, you don't even know what that is. <laughs> it was, I think, the, 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 the time in South Africa, it's a 25-year-old teaspoon Balvenie. I said, Mike, you can't have, you don't do blends. I'll serve this up to your mates and see what they think about this. Um, you don't do blends, so you don't need to try this 25-year-old teaspoon. <laughs> to, to put that into perspective, that's a multi-thousand dollar bottle of whiskey if it was still held on to Balvenie, essentially. Aye. Like unbelievably rare stuff um which is not a bad segue to our our fourth and final dram of the night uh because finding this particular distillery in the format that we see it tonight if it is the particular distillery that i think it might be is quite a rare and unique trick as well um it's uh, it's our right. island number three for those uh, who, who do have the, the packs packet at, at home it's the one with the Back to the Future referencing uh, label on it. Isla number three, uh, age 13 years, batch four. So essentially just, just you know, reiterating what, what that means is it's Isla number three. So it is a, it's an undisclosed distillery from the small island of Isla. It's the third distillery that has been undisclosed. Um, it's age 13 years and it's batch four from this particular distillery that's been given the designation of Isla number three. Um, Again, sometimes we're allowed to name them, sometimes we're not. Um, this label actually features on all variants. We haven't changed the label. So this is the actual label that comes on our, if you, on our named Lafroig. So we have a Lafroig label that looks exactly the same as this, which is strange. Um, we haven't done anything to change it. Uh, and we just called it Isla number three. Now, when we first were, the first, Lafroy that we weren't allowed to name, we called it a Williamson uh, as a nod to the late Bessie Williamson, who was the distillery manager from the late 50s and up until mid 60s, late 60s. Um, so she would, she, she's sitting there on the shield um, up in the, up in the flying like a broomstick above the barrel there. Uh, there's a Back to the Future label on the Lafroy label. Now, the story about the Back to the Future, there was a competition many, many years ago. Feshiel, Master of Malt, went up there, as they do every year, um, and they run silly games and silly competitions and giveaways and drams and T-shirts every year they're up there. And this particular year, they ran a competition to be on the next Boutique Whiskies Isla label that they bottled. And so they had this Back to the Future themed game where there was like a treasure hunt across Isla and lots of people were playing it. And the guys who won it are these two guys that have been immortalised on the label. Uh, there were a couple of bloggers from uh, Birmingham, Living Room Whiskey was their name. They were always up on Isla, sometimes for the full week as a pair. Uh, you know, they've, they've grown up and their families and they don't always get to Isla every year these, these days, but that we've immortalized them on this label. So this is a 13 year old from another of our undisclosed distilleries, but it's very simple to work this one out um, because it is exactly the same. It was a batch of 1,479 bottles and we have bottled this at 50.2% ABV. Um, I'm not gonna tell you, <laughs> 13 years old, it suggests that distillation would have occurred around 2004, 2005, which probably eliminate Kilhoman. <laughs> 
<laughs> but we've already eliminated them all. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes we are allowed, sometimes we're not allowed. We're not allowed to name this one in writing. Um, we've just used the same label so everybody knows exactly what it is. Okay. Yeah, so, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes we don't actually know where the distillery it came held from. Um, it's not important to us. What's important is the quality of the liquid. Now this is obviously um, where I told told you right from the start. You know there is a long held belief, and certainly it's it's that when it's an unnamed Isla, it's always Kalila, um, and that's simply because Kalila is the largest distillery on Isla by some some margin. I think it's almost double the next largest distillery, which is. Um, Um, just, just, just jumping in there while you look at that, I've, I've, I've uh, been very tender to look at the YouTube comment section, which, which I just have. Um, and I just want to answer a quick question there from Chris Taylor, who says, uh, good, good chat. Can we get these in Oz or buy direct from uh, Batuki Company UK? So these, a lot of these samples came from packs that we had to bastardize a little bit to make these virtual tastings and that sort of thing, um, which was just the, the case of 2020. So this actually came out of the greatest hits pack, which is sold out in Australia. I do have, a, I think I've got a couple of these you know, various things ones left but um i think in the full bottles most of these whiskies are, are long gone because the um the, the 500 mil full bottles would have gone and the other ones um can left but um yeah that I, I know they're in australia you might have to do a bit of digging if you're in the uk to find them yeah i, th I think we may have some of these available and export still i'm pretty certain when say so we did the english whiskey in canada and they were asking about that and i checked stock and there was still in some in the export stock um, so there could be a case sent out. I'm pretty certain there is some Isla number three, unless it's all been gone gone recently. There might be some of that in export stock as well. But, um, now, when we did this tasting, we did this tasting on on uh, on Saturday night with the greatest hits in Canada, uh, and and the Kensington Wine Market is the the guys who got them out there. Uh, he thought it'd be fun if we just spin the wheel. Uh, to see what comes out on the top rather than, you know, rather than roll a die. Let's spin the wheel and see what comes out. And the first whiskey that comes out in the tasting was this, and we started right here. Uh, it's always a bit risky when there's some heavily peated stuff in a wheel. But, uh, this is where we started our tasting on Saturday night. <laughs> big, big night on Saturday then. There's a, you know, in, in terms of the lineup tonight, we haven't been moving in rarity or price. We've been moving in flavor profile. And I think anyone who's tasting this whiskey right now We'll understand pretty clearly why this is the last whiskey of the night. Um, but yeah, big, big ballsy move to go with it first on the night. Yeah, well, we spanned the wheel and that was where it started. So um, it actually, it, 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 we were all laughed about it at the time. But actually, it quite worked. I can't remember what the second one was, but um, it stood up. Whatever it was, we actually did stand up afterwards. The uh, What did we do in that night? We did the Dufton 10, the Dufton 10 came out in there, and that was a Glen, the Glendullen 12. That was another great whiskey that stood up there. Brine, <sighs> smoke, seaweed. You know, That's very, very typical Isla, isn't it? That brininess coming across. Where, where can I get oysters at this time of night in, in Sydney? <laughs> like this, this is what I'm thinking right now. Oh, yes. Yeah, this with a, with a plate of oysters. Oh, yes. Or barbecue mackerel. Yeah, um, it's a slightly metallic. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It. Like in in my initial segue into this whiskey, certain distilleries on Isla, and maybe if we're going to allude to a distillery starting with La and ending with Freud, they have a brand to that they've established and developed, and they want to protect that, and they sell out of a lot of stuff as well. So they can't really be selling too much stuff out there. So that's why it's so rare and so great to find whiskey at a good age. There's not too many 13 year old Lafroigs on the market at the moment at 48.6. There's even less above, you know, 48% just to see this distillery in its, in its, it's such as it's muscular brutish force element. Um, a really special whiskey. And again, another one of my favorites, from all the tastings we did last year that I wanted to, to revisit tonight. It's really quite ashy, isn't it, as well, which... Which 
sometimes that word you would associate with other distilleries next to it. I, yeah. I think maybe like an Ardbeg, I, I, I find personally to be quite ashy sometimes. Um, but that knows that initial aroma, that very coastal, that's, that can't be from any other place, I don't think. Yeah, there's those medicinal notes definitely come out with a drop of water. And sort of a lastoplast. I, I, I call yeah. that hospital floor. Other people call it bandage. Bit, bit of journaling, yeah. Hospital floor, yeah. Yeah, the ashy note normally I associate with a Kalila, sort of like that ashy note, but it's not, it's not, it hasn't got that citrus, barbecued citrus. I've always seen that, that signature note when you put it on your hands. Yep. That's a trick I haven't seen for a lot of years. And people are wondering where I remember 10 years ago when I was getting into whiskey, every whiskey tasting you do, the brand ambassador would get up there and pour a bit of whiskey and rub it on their hands. I haven't seen it done for a, for a long time in a, in a public sense, but I still do it every now and again. But um, it, it basically the, the sweat and things in your hand take the alcohol out and you you get the aroma. Is that sort of the idea behind it? Yeah, I think it's you can get those signature notes. So if when you do that with Kalila, for me, I always get those, you know, when you put lemons on a barbecue and get charred lemon, that's what it always smells like. And then it goes into that driftwood beach bonfire embers and, and that's always um, that signature note that comes out in almost every Kalila I do that to. Um, this has got much more sort of coke, anthracite, blacksmith's forge sort of notes coming out now. But um, Blacksmith's forge, that's very good. I like that. I like that note a lot. I, I was I was an apprentice shipbuilder many, many years ago and I spent uh, a long uh, three months in a blacksmith shop that we would be making um, pipe clips, um, big rudders and stabilizer fins. And we had a blacksmith forge in there for beat and we had a big pneumatic foot square hammer for beaten red steel. Um, yeah, it's good fun. And that, that anthracite smell of Coke. Of course you were. I, I don't know why I ever thought otherwise that you weren't a shipbuilder at one point in your life. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, whiskey is my hobby. Uh, so I was an engineer all my, most of my life uh, and started off as a shipbuilder many, mm. many years ago. Then went to yacht building. I built yachts in the Far East for seven years. And uh, again, not specifically related to this whiskey, but how has the, um, the, the baking, the, uh, the bread been going recently? Oh, baking. I, I haven't bought bread for a year now because I've been at home for a year. And yeah, you know, it was all normally I'm traveling. And so I only get to bake when I'm home for a few days. Um, we haven't bought bread for a year. I bake every week, a couple of loaves. And um, sometimes when the family will come around and make baguettes, I'm quite good at me baguettes now. But again, a bit of a bit of a sourdoughish, not a sourdough, but a, a poolish. Uh, where you leave it to ferment just a little while. But, um, yeah, baking bread. I love baking bread. Just the smell, the aromas of baking bread is just the best ever. Fresh bread and coffee and whiskey. I mean, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's been a while since I've walked into a distillery and right at the time of that first ferment, and I think that might be the greatest smell ever, that yeasty, fruity sort of sort of notes that I, I love, but... Yeasty um, grains, yeah. yeah. You get that from the from the beating of the bread when you're kneading it, yeah. That sort of that sort of aroma's come out. Um, this is this is a whiskey that's almost quite brutal and quite violent on its initial nosing. It's it's not a, a muck around whiskey, but now that it's been opened in the glass a little bit, and I'm I'm grabbing from uh, brand new bottles as well tonight, so that these haven't been opened before tonight. And it's starting to rescind a little bit in that, like the complexity is coming through now. There's a lot of fruitiness going in there. There's that sort of a little bit of barbecue pineapple, maybe slightly charred pineapple. Yeah. It's a lovely sweetness on the, on the nose. And that tropical fruit comes across on the palate as well. Hmm. I am, sp I am spitting most of this tonight, this morning. This morning, yeah. Well, it is, it is what officially, is it 9, 9.30 a.m. yet? Yeah. Or just, just about, or just about yeah. 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 
Well, look, I've got um, a full day ahead of me. Yeah, and <laughs> and on on that note, I know we did ask you for an hour uh, before you started today, so you've been incredibly generous with with your with your ninety minutes. I don't know if you, if you had a, a slide to put up for this one, but I would ask if if there's anyone that has any final questions, uh, please send them through now because I do need to let Dave actually do some work and uh, oh. and, and not just drink whiskey with us Australians all afternoon or evening or morning, whatever it is. I've got a load of cask samples on my desk that I've got to go through anyway. So I've got. Um, it is a tough life sometimes. I understand. Got eight new cask samples to have a look at this morning. A bit later on, and I will be spitting. So it's just doing. I'll be tasting the WSET way: nose, water, nose, taste, spit, write some notes. Yeah. There, there's our label and the tasting notes for this. So yeah, smoky. Aromas, of course. Um, I was getting some medicinal notes coming through. I like the tropical fruitiness that's come through. And it's gone a bit ashy again. And that sort of blacksmith forge sort of ash rather than the wood wood ash that I, I normally associate, like driftwood beach fires with Kalila and, and charred lemon skins with Kalila for me. I think it's a cracking... Um, Single malt, this one, absolutely beautiful, even at this time of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I think the balance is just perfect. I, I, I don't know exactly where you're located in proximity to um, the ocean or, or a fishing port, but you've probably got a better chance of getting genuinely fresh seafood than I do right now at, a, at what is, you know, coming up to 8.30 p.m. Uh, so... Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I live in the UK, probably as about as far away from the ocean as you possibly get. Just north of London in, in deepest mid Bedfordshire. It's the furthest I've ever lived away from the ocean. All, you know, I've been a shipbuilder, boat builder most of my working life and I've always lived on the, uh, uh, you know, on the beach sort of thing. Certainly in the Far East, I lived on the beach. Um, even when I was a shipbuilder, I lived right by the coast. The end of my road just used to run into the creek. So, uh, yeah, I'm about as far away from the ocean as you could possibly get. Uh, and during this lockdown, I had to drive. I had to tell I don't. I need to go and see the ocean, otherwise I'm going to kill somebody because uh, it had been like 10 months without seeing the ocean. And so we drove down to, I had a delivery to make, delivery of whiskey to make to my rum oppo, uh, Boutique, Boutique Pete. And I thought, well, I'll do, because we do a little um, Thursday evening series called Tots and Drams where I educate Pete on whiskey and we talk a couple of, and we, it's, it doesn't matter if anyone's watching, it's just me and Pete hanging out for an hour and talking shit about rum and whiskey. I have 30 minutes, he's got 30 minutes and we, we drink and, and laugh and, and talk and we don't care if anyone watches or not, but that's, that's what it's there for. It's a bit of education. Uh, and so I had a, a, a box full of whiskey to take down for him for this year's series uh, and it allowed us to have a socially distanced walk along the beach because he lives down on the south coast you know 10 minutes walk from the beach so it was a pleasant wintry that's beautiful beautiful day in the winter um <clears throat> to walk along the beach in the sunshine Excellent. and that was my fix yeah no look mate thank thank you very much for your time it's it's a very good point if anyone um as i'm sure you all, all sort of do have have the instagram jump on uh, at boutique dave uh because he tends to be going live at times when we're all going to bed uh, so after a few drinks back from the pub, it's always good to throw a few <laughs> grenades into the situation. But um, my absolute pleasure to have a, a chat with you again. Um, thank you oh, for your time. You. It's and, and hopefully we, we can do this again um, soon. And, and hopefully in the, in the not too distant future, you, you you guys over there will be looking on the up and be out and about and, and we'll be out and about and we'll all be uh, moving forward to be doing this in, in the same room at some point. But until that, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to say good day. Lovely to see you. Thanks for having me again. Awesome. Yeah. And thanks to everyone on, on the on the Facebook and